Hi, coming up next on wood carving, we'll be making this orca and her newborn calf. So stick around. Hi, come on in. My name is Rick Boots. Welcome to wood carving. Today we're going to be making this wood carving of an orca and her newborn calf. And what I've done here is, after the pieces were carved and painted, it's been mounted on a quarter inch wooden dowel, drilled into a piece of driftwood, and it just sort of rests down there. And then the baby is also fastened with a wooden dowel right alongside there. And to help us today is uh, our orca expert, my daughter, Juliana Boots. How are you doing, Julie? Pretty good, Dad. How's your carving coming along? Pretty nice. Great. Um, Julie's going to be helping us with uh, information on the orcas as we go along here. I'm going to slide that over by you to make a little room. Okay. For carving out the, uh, the adult, orca here, what I'm using is a piece of basswood that I've fastened into the vise, and I'm using the large gouges to rough that out and just to shape the corners on it. I'm using a 35 millimeter number two gouge, which has a fairly flat shape. It's almost like a chisel, and that's great for rounding down the corners. You have to be a little careful because with this particular carving you have a uh, dorsal fin that's sticking up and a couple of other fins here and there. You don't want to split those off. But if you do, it's no problem. Just take some glue and glue them back on, let it dry, and you're ready to go. This is a great way for roughing out some of the wood on the larger pieces and it saves you a fair amount of time. For doing the fins underneath, or the pectoral fins, you have to be careful because the grain on this is going lengthwise and the fins are actually protruding crosswise. So you're dealing with what they call uh, cross grain and it can be kind of fragile. The trick to doing that is start out making small cuts on either side. In this case, I'm just making small V's. You can also do this with a knife, but it'll take you just a little bit longer, and I think you have better control with a gouge if you don't try to take too much off at once. And you want to be careful not to pry that against the fin and break it off, too. get the rest of that with a knife later. And I'll finish rounding off the corners here. And now that we've got the big pieces rounded off, we can just kind of pull up a chair, sit down, get our trusty carving knife, and go to work. When you're carving with a knife, there's one classic stroke that'll do 90% of the work, and that's called a paring cut. 
And to do that, you brace your thumb against the end of the wood, and then just slowly close your hand, drawing the knife through the wood. And try to keep your thumb out of the line of fire there. And you just take off small chips as you go. Whatever you do, you don't want to pull it like this, because that, uh, when that leaves the wood, you have no control. Another cut that's handy is called a levering cut, where you brace the thumb of your left hand, assuming you're right-handed, against the back of the knife, and then just make a little, little nibbling action. And between those two cuts, you can get just about any area on a wood carving. And then we just kind of carve along here or round them out. Just like you're doing, Julie. <laughs> How's it coming along? Pretty good. Julie's working on the, uh, the calf over there. Then when we're done, we can put them together. So how did you get started in carving, Julie? Well, basically from watching you. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to carve, and I made up my mind I would, no matter what. <laughs> so no matter where you put the tools, or if you close the door or anything like that, I'd get in and I'd find the tools anyway. <laughs> yeah, Julie started carving at a very young age, I think about three, kind of by default, and uh, started with relief carving, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. Or we use the gouges in the wood? Yep, and the rules were keep both hands on the tool and wear something on your feet. Because if you drop the tool, you don't want it hitting your foot. Yeah, and have the wood like we were doing earlier fastened to the bench. Now, when did you first develop an interest in orcas? I think probably about fifth or sixth grade. I. I just, I'd seen a show on orcas on TV, mm -hmm. and I just thought they were really neat. So I started reading all the books I could on orcas and watching all the documentaries and stuff. But there's only so much you can learn from just watching and reading about whales. So, and so I think when we went down to the Sea World, that that really helped, too. And a couple of years ago, we had a chance to go down to Orlando and uh, look at the orcas down there. It was really neat. One of the things that we uh, did and Julie's interest in the orcas really uh, kind of spurred our interest as well. And we'd uh, go into the park early and go way back to where the, uh, the orcas were. And it was very quiet. Nobody else was back there. And just watching these huge animals swimming around and just gliding through the water, it's really a sensation. It's, it's very hard to describe the impact that it has. As a matter of fact, um, the carving that we have was one that Julie designed. And then we uh, drew up the paper patterns and cut it out and did as we're doing here. But that carving was inspired by one of our trips down there where one of the uh, killer whales had just had a newborn calf. And when we got down there, it was only a few hours old and was swimming along be, uh, beside the parent. And it was just kind of a really neat thing to watch. It was just so beautiful. Now, how big is a uh, baby orca when they're born? How heavy was that? Do you remember? Um, I think it was 300 pounds. 300 pounds? Yeah. Wow. And um, it was six feet long. It didn't look that big compared to the grown-up. Uh, she's like 16 to 18 feet. Wow. She's not even that big for an orca. Mm-hmm. Now, how long are the, uh, the calves cared for? How long do they stay with their mother? They stay with their mother for quite a long time. They, they never really leave their mother. I mean, they stop nursing, but they stay in the same pod and uh -huh. always like to stay close to their mother. And weren't you telling me that the, the milk has, uh, is very rich? Yeah, it's got ten times the amount of fat in it that normal cow milk does. Oh, gee. It's 35 percent fat. 35 percent? Yeah. Sounds like uh, butter. Yeah, pretty close. Yeah, I bet they gain weight fast. And they do. Most of the marine mammals have really high fat milk. Uh huh. The seals and the dolphins and stuff, that's how they get that thick layer of insulating blubber that they have. Uh huh. Also gives the orca a nice round shape. Now, when a, a young orca is born, is it, uh, can it swim on its own? Yep, they can swim from the moment they're born, but their mothers have to push them up to the surface to breathe, uh -huh. to take their first breath. 
I remember when we were watching the one down in the uh, at SeaWorld that uh, I would notice that it was swimming very close to its mother. And you said there was a reason for that. Riding right along in its mom's slipstream. So kind of getting drawn along by the suction? Mm -hmm. They don't have the muscle strength and the cartilage in their dorsal fin and their tails and their flippers is really weak. When they're first born, they're just all floppy. They've got, uh -huh. it's not stiff yet, so their fins basically, their dorsal fin just lies right on their back. How long does that take to develop? I don't know. It, I guess it varies with the whale, I mean. Uh -huh. Sometimes, sometimes they're born with less developed cartilage and sometimes they're born with the dorsal fin standing up. It, I guess it's just one of these things that varies. Mm -hmm. And you said that they stay with their, uh, with their family group. How are the, uh, how are the uh, killer whales or orcas, um, how do they, what's their social life like? Oh, they, they, there are two types of pods. Uh huh. The resident and the transient pods. And the transient pods are generally smaller. We do about 10 orcas. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that hunt the other whales and the sea lions and the dolphins and stuff there. Mm -hmm. They're more after the mammals. And they're quieter than the, the resident pods. They don't talk as much because they need to be quiet mm -hmm. so most of their prey can hear them. How many whales do they normally have in a pod? Mm. I think up to about 30 or more. Wow. But sometimes pods will get together and they'll form a super pod. Oh, really? You can have up to 60 whales in a super pod. Wow. A bunch of different pods. Wow. Look on that tape I have and it's got all the different sounds they make. Uh-huh. I think they're up near Norway, near one of the fjords. Now, are all the whales in a pod uh, related to each other? Not necessarily. I mean, most generally they are. Uh -huh. But all the, the males, the pods are mostly females, with um, the alpha in the pod being the dominant male, uh -huh. or dominant female. Mm -hmm. And um, the young males will swim off and form their own pods and stuff. Oh, really? So um, a lot of times the babies in a pod will have fathers that aren't in the pods. When you get the body of the orca rounded off and the angles kind of cleared away, then you can start detailing the fins. On this dorsal fin, I'm being very, very careful as I do this so I don't split it off. And one of the tricks that you can do is, first of all, carve off little chips when you're doing it. And the other thing is you can actually thin the edges of it so the edges look thin, but leave the middle of it a little thicker. And that creates the illusion that it's thick. And also at the same time, it makes it a little bit stronger. I'll come around and do this side. Now, if I've got this right, Julie, um, the fins are important, aren't they, in telling the whales apart? Yep. Um, more a shorter, more triangular fin, like what you got there, mm -hmm. is a female's fin. Okay. And when they're standing more pointed straight up, that's a male's fin. Okay. So that's why when you did your pattern, um, it has this shaped fin, right? Yep. Okay. But with the calves, you can't tell Uh until -huh. they get older because the fins sort of they don't grow quite as fast as the rest of the whale. And we can do the same thing with the uh, pectoral fins here by carving down a little bit at a time and then making a little horizontal cut. We can cut those chips clear. And what do they use the uh, pectoral fins for, Julie? Steering, stopping. They'll also slap their flippers, pectoral fins, on the water. And that can be used to communicate because it's louder than just squeaking a lot of the time. Uh huh. And what does it mean? Anything particular? Mm, not 
really. Sometimes it can be used for um for stunning fish too. Oh really? That's often why why they'll slap the why they'll slap their tails because it's such a loud bang underwater. It's like a cannon underwater. And it uh, stuns the fish. Mm-hmm. Whoa! I wouldn't want to be around for that. <laughs> you <could> get hit. <laughs> for detailing the outside of the fin, just make a cut down sort of a little notch shape, and then come from the other side and round that, and that begins to separate the fin from the body. Now structurally, it's mounted by the front, so when we're carving, we, don't, we want to kind of blend that shape into the body there, whereas the back is a little more free of the body, so we can notch that in. I generally like to fudge just a little bit with the fins and make them thicker and a little more durable than they might actually appear in nature. Why don't you tell me once about one of the uh, female orcas and her calf that was annoyed by something that was going on? Oh yeah, the calf wanted to play, uh -huh. but um, the mother and the rest of the pod just wanted to sleep. But the calf wouldn't leave the mom alone, so she started slapping her tail against the water, which is also how orcas show if they're annoyed. Oh, really? Yeah. Same with dolphins, too. They'll slap their tails if they're annoyed. Now, are dolphins and orcas related? Uh-huh. Orcas are basically overgrown dolphins. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Seriously overgrown. <laughs> wow. Yeah, most of the toothed whales are related. I mean... Dolphins, the belugas, orcas, narwhals, the ones with the big tusks, and the beluga, or white whale. Mm -hmm. Another one of the toothed whales is the sperm whale, but I don't know how closely he's related to orcas and dolphins. What do um, orcas do for fun? Oh, they play games together, they, they breach. Uh-huh, and that, what is that? That's when they jump straight out of the water uh -huh. and come down on their sides or sometimes on their fronts. And also, they, they'll, they've been known to rub their bodies along smooth paddles in, some, in certain beaches huh. or through thick kelp grass and seaweed. They, they like the feel of it because they love to be touched and petted and hugged and stuff like that. Uh -huh. How heavy does an adult orca get to be? Ooh, they can get to be about, oh, 6,000 to 8,000 pounds. Wow. Some of the larger ones are 12,000 pounds. And I think the biggest orca ever, a male who was 32 feet, weighed 20,000 pounds. Gee. So when they're doing their splash, that's a lot of weight to be coming down in the water. Yeah. Do they ever get hurt doing that? No, they, they turn their bodies just right, because if they came down flat on their stomachs, it'd sort of be like doing a four-ton belly flop. <laughs> Ow. Yeah. So they come up and come down on their side then? Mm hmm Oh, neat. Okay, as we get closer to the tail here, or the fluke, am I calling it the right thing, Julie? Fluke, tail. Fluke, excuse me, okay. Interchangeable. Oh, okay. That'll be anatomically correct here. <laughs> As we get towards the end, uh, or it's towards, <laughs> towards the end of the, uh, the, the whale here, <laughs> uh, bringing up the rear, the, the carving gets a little tricky because they have uh, a ridge that runs down through the dorsal part and also another ridge that runs down through the ventral part and that's where the, uh, the well, the bones and the cartilage connect, is that right? Mm hmm Okay. So that presents a little bit of a carving problem, because what we have to do is hollow that out. And also, because the grain is kind of going this way, but our shapes are going this way, we have a little bit of a grain problem we have to be careful with. Now, one of the things that you can do is you can take a, a gouge, or in this case, I'm going to use a curved knife that has a sort of a hooked blade mounted onto a handle. And that'll get in there, kind of like a 
regular carving knife and hollow that out. Ooh. You like that, huh? Yeah. It's a little weird when, to use, but uh, this was made for me by a, an old guy in Phoenix. Arizona? Yeah. I said, here, try this, young man. <laughs> I said, hey, that works pretty good. <laughs> So anyway, that gets under there to hollow out the uh, area underneath the flukes. Now the uh, flukes are used what, pretty much just for swim, you know, for the power stroke on the swimming, or do they yep. use it for anything else? Just basically the power stroke and the tail logs is what, when they slam their flukes on the water. Okay, and what what does that mean? Well, that's sort of like the same with them slapping their flippers to communicate stuff like that, but it's a lot more powerful. Okay. Is you think that um, a dolphin, when it swings its tail around, could actually kill a person. That much force? Yeah. Wow. And dolphins only weigh 300 pounds. Now, how do the biologists tell the whales apart? I've seen videotapes and documentaries where they say, oh, that's so-and-so, uh, and that's so-and-so, and it's like they really know the individual whales. How do they tell them apart? A lot of times, orcas will have scars and stuff like that on their sides. Mm -hmm. Plus, the dorsal fins are different shapes, and sometimes some are bent to the side or something, and some have notches. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Also, the markings, too. Uh-huh. Like, they're the saddle patch, the gray area, that's um, not, all, not all whales have it, but it's mm -hmm. right behind the dorsal fin. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of like a fingerprint. No whale, no two whales have the same saddle patch. Now that's interesting. So it's like a fingerprint. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're just kind of about finishing this guy up anyway. We're about the halfway point. The thing that I found when I was making it is in order to get the smooth finish that gives it the streamlined look, uh, the best way to do that is sandpaper. And it takes a lot of sanding. I found the sanding actually take, took longer than the carving of it. I'm going to just notch the end of the tail here. And this one to be real careful with because you're dealing with a funny grain in the wood. And you don't want to split at this stage. Well, I think, uh, I think she's pretty close to uh, being done here. Now, for sanding, what I used was uh, a piece of 180 sandpaper and just spent a couple hours sanding <laughs> <laughs> to get it smooth and then moved to finer, like 220. And then, um, before I painted it, I sealed it in lacquer. And I did that a couple times. And the, the lacquer, uh, use a can of spray lacquer, it soaks into the wood, and it'll actually make some of the uh, parts like the fin and the flukes, a little more durable, helps, helps harden that up a little bit. And then when I got done with that, I turned it over to Julie to paint because she knew the markings so well. Um, would you tell a little bit about how you painted it, Julie? Well, before I painted it, first I carved the mouth and I carved the blowhole and the eyes. The eyes were just two little curved lines, one arcing above the other and the bottom one curved in the opposite way to form sort of a shape like the human eye. Mm -hmm. And the blowhole I just put right about here. Okay. The mouth's just sort of a little curved line on either side. Then I painted the, whole, the underside white. I put two little spots on either side of the head, the eye spots. And um, they're just right above the eye. And they go back a little ways. Mm-hmm. Then I painted the, the underside of the tail white and the little white mark that comes up onto the sides. And then I painted, painted the rest of the thing black and I touched up any white that I accidentally painted over. <laughs> so it's a good idea to paint the white on first. Yeah, it's easier to paint, repaint it than it is to try and paint, mm -hmm. the, paint the white over the black to begin with. What kind of paints would you recommend people use for painting the orca? Probably acrylics. I used Mars Black and Titanium White Great. for painting. Hey, let's take a look at your orca here. Okay. 
Okay. Ooh. There he is. Oh, that's coming along really good. So that'll be sort of swimming along like this. Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, neat. Great. Well, thanks a lot for your help, Julie. Anytime. Um, next week, we're going to be making a old-style decoy puffin. And it'll be kind of a neat project. We'll show you a couple different ways to antique it to make it look old. Hey, thanks for dropping by. Thanks for being with us, Julie. And until yep. next time, it's Rick and Julie Boots wishing you happy carving. Rick Boots has written two books entitled Wood Carving Step by Step, Woodland Creatures and Santas. Rick demonstrates and describes through extensive illustrations and photographs how to carve a chipmunk, a river otter, a red fox, an alpine St. Nicholas, an Adirondack Santa and his bear, and a Swiss St. Nicholas. The two book collection is available by calling 1-800-950-9648. The price is $29.90 plus shipping and handling.